So I think the reason that we decided to do this piece is that Stan Kroenke, Josh Kroenke, the Kroenkes in general, there is still that sort of air of mystery about them. They're not particularly known here in the UK. They're slightly more public in the US. There is that characterization of Silent Stan that's kind of followed him everywhere he goes. And I think we wanted to sort of get past that silence, find out a bit more about what these people are actually like, you know, have that human side to it. But also, crucially, look at their work, their time with Arsenal. And so what we've done is we've looked at their initial investment to the club, how it all began. But then we focus more so on the period since 2018, when they became 100% owners of the club, because that is the point at which this became the Cronkies Club, you know, in, in name, in deed, in everything. And it's been a really tumultuous time for Arsenal, a time of tremendous change, not just on that front. We've seen managerial change. Arsene Wenger left, Unai Emery came in. He left, Mikel Arteta came in. Uh, it's been a time of significant spending in the transfer market, some big, big arrivals, people like Nicola Pepe, people like Thomas Partey. It's also been a time of significant change at boardroom level. So Chips Keswick has stood down as chairman. And we've seen a lot of changes on the executive side too. Ivan Gazidis, who was the chief executive, moved on. Raul Senier took over as head of football. He's now no longer there. So it's been a really, really frenetic period for Arsenal and for the Cronkies. And it's a really interesting time, I think, to take stock and see you know, what we can learn about the way in which they're running their, this club and what their plans might be for the future. Because I think that's really what's going to interest Arsenal fans. You know, What is the direction of travel for this club under their governance, under their control? And I think it's particularly interesting because you know, we reported on the Athletic not long ago, the signing of Thomas Partey is something Arsenal could only do with an injection of cash from this ownership. I just think it was financially impossible for them to do it by any other means, especially with it being a buyout clause, one payment. They needed that help. And so looking at that and saying, why Arsenal? Why now? Why are the Cronkies doing this now? Are they going to be doing more of that in the future? It's been a fascinating process. Uh, and I think Arsenal fans are really going to enjoy learning about it. The silent stand stuff interests me because I've always wondered whether it's by design and and if so, what the purpose is of it, because it's kind of it feeds into this image of the absentee owner, the person that it's a weakness of his. Mm. I just I, I is it intentional? I don't think it's intentional. It's something that was attached to him by the media quite early on in his career in sports. And I don't think there's any great love for it, really, on part of, of KSC and the Cronkies. But it's interesting, you know, what owners aren't silent? I think it's a really interesting question. I mean, think of Roman Abramovich. It's not like we hear him piping up in the media. Hey, also, James, if, if, if the owners that aren't silent, we have our fun with. If you think about what's happening at West Ham, mm. the things that are used against those three people are always what they're saying, are always the things that they spill out onto social media or yeah. into, into tabloid columns. What's the... Um, I mean, lately, obviously, Josh Kroenke has become a little bit more of a prominent figure. You mm. mentioned him there. Like, what's the dynamic between father and son? That's a really interesting question because they're not the same person. And you're right that Josh, certainly geographically, has been closer to Arsenal. There was a period in 2018, just before Arsene Wenger went, where he spent, I think it was sort of eight weeks or so, on the ground in London, getting to know the club, to understand the culture. And uh, I think, you know, consequently... It's, after that, he's been more and more involved. It's been more difficult recently with the pandemic, but they've taken steps to address that by making an appointment to the board. Tim Lewis, who's a very trusted advisor, close associate, advised on the purchase of Arsenal in the first place. He's a, a partner at Clifford Chance. And he's become kind of a, a natural sort of boots on the ground figure for the Cronky regime. Someone who's here and is, knows Arsenal intimately. You know, he's an Arsenal fan himself, Tim Lewis. So that's really helped them. But I think what's really interesting about the, the question of sort of silence is why does that rankle with people? And I think it's because you, you have to weigh words against deeds. You know, if we talk about Abramovich, yes, he doesn't say anything, but he goes out and he spends the money. And that kind of speaks volumes on its own terms. And it seems to me that, you know, that's the kind of commitment that Arsenal fans talk, mean when they say that we want to have an owner who cares, who invests emotionally and financially. I suppose the Abramovich thing is because the deeds are so strong and the evidence for them is so strong, you end up creating this character, character in your mind. Yeah. You, you kind of fill in the, the, the blanks in his personality. With Stan Kroenke, with Josh Kroenke, I, I, I've never feel, felt completely able to do that to the point also where I don't really, 
I don't really have a handle on what their attitude is towards the club. Is that, I mean, is there any clarity over that now? Yeah, I mean, we hear a little bit more from Josh than we do from Stan. And I don't think that's surprising because if you, if you think about Josh, I mean, he's a guy who he was a college basketball player, played basketball to a pretty high standard. As part of that process, you know, given who his family was, given the upbringing he had, he was facing awkward questions from the media all the time. He underwent media training when he was kind of 18 years old. And I think you see that in Josh. He's, he's very comfortable in that sphere. He's comfortable in that world. And Stan probably isn't to the same degree. Um, but, you know, I, I do think behind closed doors, sure, there are disagreements. You know, sure, there are times when they don't see eye to eye. But one thing they do very well, they present a very united front. And, uh, you know, things that happen behind closed doors stay there. Uh, and when it comes to the issue of Arsenal, they always seem to be on the same page. And I think Arsenal is an incredibly valuable asset to them. There are so many reasons that Stan wanted to invest in Arsenal. Like, if you think about it, his background is in real estate, really. So he comes to Arsenal, 2006, first time he ever visits. And he goes to visit the Emirates Stadium building site. And he sees Highbury House under construction. He has a meeting there with David Dean, uh, a few other there, a few other executives. They sit on kind of, you know, upturned buckets around a kind of makeshift table. And David Dean takes him on a tour of the Emirates. And you can just see in Stan's mind, as someone who understands real estate, as someone who understands sport, this is a prime, prime, prime opportunity for him. And, you know, invested on a small stake, that's steadily growing. The ownership situation changed. It accelerated when Danny Fisman died. And over time, the Cronkies' commitment has been absolute. And I think at this point, really, if you look at their portfolio of teams and franchises, Arsenal have to be kind of the, the, the jewel jewel Jewel, jewel, if you'll, if you'll forgive the, the mispronunciation, in the crown, I think, with the LA Rams. And I think more so than the Rams, Arsenal are the most international team that the Cronkies have. There is nobody that they work with that has that kind of global appeal in, in, in Asia, in Africa, that Arsenal do. So I think it is a real focus for them. I think you're right that they are kind of characterised as being absent but some of that comes down to the fact that the way they run their businesses, the way they run their businesses is they trust their executives absolutely. And, you know, there's good and bad to that. I think it all comes down to do you appoint the right people? Yeah. And also, what is the virtue of being a visible owner in the first place? I mean, that's an that's a entirely different conversation. Mm. Um, I think something that interests me from the summer or the extended late summer that we've had was the Thomas Partey signing. Um mainly because it was so incongruous with what I was expecting. If you, if you look at the kind of the, the atmosphere that had developed around Arsenal um, since the redundancies, mm. um, since the departure of Raul Sanyehi, and then they make this incredibly aggressive move towards the end of the summer to the point where it's not often that the Arsenal are the team bullying, for want of a better expression, bullying other European sides out of their talent. Mm. And it, it felt reflective of something. I don't know of what yet, beyond just what he's worth to the side. It felt like the kind of signing you make when perhaps a, a new era begins or a new attitude develops. Am I, am I wrong there? No, I think you're absolutely right. I think it was a statement. And in fairness to the ownership, it's something they said all along. When we have 100% control of this club, when it's truly ours, we're going to take further steps. We're going to make investments. And actually, in the summer transfer window, you know, they were looking at a situation, and we talk about this in the piece, where potentially they were going to be able to sign Thomas Partey and a player like Husam Oar if they could find a payment structure that would enable them to do both deals. As it happened, they couldn't make that agreement. They paid the release clause for Partey. It's a pretty punishing release clause too. And I think that marks... I agree with you. It marks a bit of an era for Arsenal. It's a different way of doing things. I think the ownership sense that they look at the economic landscape there are some market opportunities out there. And I think that's going to remain the case for the next, who knows how long, 12 to 24 months. I think clubs that have access to resource, that have financial backing in the way that Arsenal do via the Cronkies, could maybe take advantage in this situation. Um, I don't think that means necessarily we're going to see signing after signing or, or you know, a degree of spending that's completely alien because that's not the philosophy. Ultimately, you know, Stan, he is a businessman. He wants to run these clubs like businesses. He believes that Arsenal should be predominantly self-sustainable. And it's a really interesting question. I mean, I think there's been enormous frustration from Arsenal fans about that. But if you asked Arsenal 
for the kind of owner they would want? I always think that's a really difficult question to answer because I actually think, you know, Stan is someone who doesn't get involved in football matters too heavily. He's not someone who's going to sort of reach, you know, he's not someone who's going to take the club off course by following a whim. He's someone who wants to make the business sustainable beyond him uh, and on, in its own right. And, and I think that those things, you know, whatever you may personally feel about Stan or his politics or anything else, you know, are quite commendable and probably, probably attributes that fans would want in an owner. I reckon one of the reasons why that felt in Congress and why it was not a shock because mm. there have been rumblings all summer is because um, the Arsenal structure is quite nebulous because there's been yeah. so much flux and because uh, people have left the club without there being direct replacements for them. Um, you kind of, the image is of a club that isn't streamlined, that isn't, um, isn't functioning as well as it might do, which doesn't necessarily have the right people in, in yeah. the right roles. What is, what does the hierarchy actually look like now beneath well, firstly, let's start with Josh Kroenke and what his day-to-day -day role is um, and what happens beneath him between um, the ownership and Mikel Arteta. So at the very top of the organisation, you have the ownership, right? You have the Kroenkes themselves. Then you've got the board. Both Stan and Josh sit on the board. As I mentioned, they've appointed Tim Lewis to sit alongside them on that board now. Uh, Lord Harris as well, I think, is increasingly influential. He's someone with a big, big business background who I think you know, helped the club be more efficient. Uh, below that, You've, of course, got the chief executive. Now we've just got one chief executive. We had the kind of twin heads of Rao Senye and Vinay Van Ketesham. Now it's just Vinay. And I think, you know, beneath that, you've got Edu and Mikel Arteta. And the way it's been characterised to me is they're sort of in, on a level pegging. It's a bit like the kind of general manager, head coach situation that the Cronkies are more accustomed to in America, let's say, with their NFL team or, or similar. And I think, you know... The way things work is Edu's got a, a very close relationship with Vinay. You know, they speak on an almost daily basis. Edu can go to the board if he wants. I think Josh is more involved with that process on a day-to-day. -day. And they really only want to go to Stan with a pretty certain recommendation. They only want to go to Stan when they've got all their ducks in a row. And that's a mistake. Maybe certain Arsenal executives, certain Arsenal situations, have they haven't always done that. You know, there's a, a great example we talk about in the piece. The summer of 2018, the Arsenal executive team, Arsene Wenger had just left and they wanted a kind of transfer war chest to get the club back into the Champions oh, League. Oh, war chest. <laughs> of course. And they went to meet Stan in America uh, and that meeting didn't go too well, really. And I think there was a feeling from what we can gather and what we understand that Arsenal maybe weren't sufficiently prepared for that meeting, weren't sufficiently prepared for the grilling they might get from Stan. In what way prepared, though? I think Stan is someone who was like, if you're going to come here and you're going to ask me for £50 million or whatever you it might be... You better have your pie charts with you. and You your better have analysis. your pie charts all in yeah, a row. Okay. Yeah, and not only that, <laughs> I want to see how that plan is going to play out over the next two to three years. You know, I think Stan is smart enough to know it's not as simple as... You give us X amount of money, we take you to the Champions League. And I think it was a really interesting kind of case study in that relationship between, between executives and ownership and how carefully that needs to be managed and how both sides kind of almost need to manage each other really to get to the right outcome. Because if you look at the following summer, 2019, pretty much the same team of executives were able to convince the ownership that, yeah, we should go and buy Nicola Pepe. So... They did that in a different way. They had a different approach. It was a more casual affair. They had a meeting at a barbecue. Uh, it wasn't really a meeting. They, they were talk, discussed it over a barbecue uh, during the American tour. I think it was Josh Kroenke was entertaining the Arsenal executives. And that time they laid out their thinking in such a way that Stan felt comfortable to make that kind of bold investment. Look, the, 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 the logic of that signing and whether or not it's a good deal can be disputed. And I think it's a whole other article. But, you know, from the Cronkies perspective, I think they would say, well, listen, that's the recommendation we were given and we backed our guys. Does this maybe describe one of the tensions between the old way of thinking in football and the more kind of Americanized professional version of club ownership where it where it was before, like you had the model whereby you had your budget mm. and you had your targets 
and there was really very little dialogue between you know the two departments responsible yeah. you got the money you went out and spent it and if you didn't produce success at the end of that then that was a problem so with the pepe example like let's let's go back to that because it's an interesting transfer forget where he is at the moment as a player because it's still only a year in mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where wh- how did that work and who were the voices that um were so convincing at that barbecue well Good question. And which pie charts were were brought to support the case? (laughs) What's really interesting, actually, is that we believe that among the Arsenal hierarchy at that time, this is summer 2019, there was some discrepancy about what sort of investment Arsenal should be making. Should they be spending that degree of resource on a centre-back or should it be a winger? And actually, it was Unai Emery, we understand, who really was passionate that he wanted a winger. His preference was for Wilfred Zahar. There were a lot of reasons that that deal was not viable. I think Crystal Palace... They understood that to be relegated would cost them an enormous amount of money. So even if you're offering them 100 million for Zaha, it's like, is it financially worth our while? Consequently, you know, Arsenal were aware of Napoli's negotiations for Pepe. That deal, given the player's age, given the lower price tag, becomes more appealing. And ultimately, the executive team in that instance, they, they pushed for the manager, the coach, as he was called at the time, in Emery, to get what he wanted. And, you know, the ownership... They back that. I would say, though, that there has been a learning curve at Arsenal for the Cronkies. You know, they came into a sport that they had experience with, but not masses. And I think that since they took full ownership, part of the reason we've seen so many changes is that there have been these learning experiences. And the the club, dating back to kind of 2019, have had concerns over efficiency of spending you know are we doing things right yeah we're 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 giving people the money when they ask for it you go right back with KSC they never said no to Arsene Wenger he was just a more reticent guy when it came to spending but you know I think they've learned something from that and I think moving forward they're trying to make those lines of communication all the clearer so when you ask me about the new structure you know it's just Edu, Arteta, Vinay and then the board above that I think they see that and they see you know, some of the changes they've been through this pandemic in terms of the redundancies, in terms of the restructure, as giving them an opportunity to communicate more effectively, more efficiently with the technical staff. I mean, I'll tell you a really interesting thing about the Partey deal is that before the Cronkies agreed to kind of push the button, activate the clause, the technical director, Edu, had to make a presentation to them in which he showed not only kind of why Partey was a good, good player, a good signing, but how he fit into a tactical identity, a tactical plan. Because if you think about a signing like Pepe, what wasn't always clear maybe was, well, where does this guy sit? How are we using him? How are we getting the best out of him? I feel like making the case for signing a Pepe type is a little bit easier because the the model of player that he is, the type of player he is, kind of speaks for itself. Like it's that, it's that dynamic whether he is this at the moment is neither here nor there. The idea of Pepe is very sound. When you talk about presenting the need for um, a parte, is Eddie there talking about um, the attribute deficiencies that exist in spe- specific art parts of the pitch? And here's what Granite Xhaka can't do. And here's why we need to have this player around him. Is it that much detail? Because it makes sense if these are football people having the conversations together. When you put the football conversation with the owner and executive, is that the, the easiest way of, of doing things? That's a really good point. And one of my sort of things that I was trying to find out, along with you know, the other members of the Arsenal team during this piece, is to what extent is someone like Stan football literate? Yeah, you know, exactly. And I, because it, his sport, really, his passion originally, like Josh, is basketball. Um, but, you know, they do have a background in soccer. They obviously work with the Colorado Rapids. Uh, and now they've been with Arsenal for such a long time. I mean, I had a great anecdote um, that we've got in the piece about how by the end of this transfer window, Stan Kroenke was talking in terminology about number sixes, number eights and number tens, <laughs> which, you know, I think is fascinating because it shows you that however it's being communicated, there is a kind of a shared technical vision, I think, for this team. And I think... That's kind of, I think, one of the big stories of this piece is the learning curve that I mentioned and how are Arsenal trying to do things differently, trying to be more efficient. I don't think anyone on the kind of KSE side is under the illusions that, you know, their association with the club has been perfect. And certainly, you know, it's been in some ways a really difficult year. We've seen the redundancies. We've seen some negative stories in the press. We all remember Gunnosaurus, things like that. Yeah. Um, But... You know, I think that they would say, look, it's 2018 since we took 100% charge. 
we're in a process and I think they're more confident about that process moving forward because I think they feel they have the right people at the helm. The article is more positive than I expected it to be. I mean, <laughs> don't, don't take that the wrong way. I, I just felt like it, the, the, the story around Arsenal has been not necessarily negative for so long, yeah. but down and despondent and resigned to not failure necessarily, but not, you know, any kind of worthwhile achievement beyond domestic cups. Mm. It feels like a lot seems to have changed tonally in quite a short space of time. Yes, and I think there are big things that did that. We've obviously touched on the, the parte deal. One thing we've not talked about is KSC's decision to restructure Arsenal's debt, which if you speak to anyone associated with Arsenal in kind of the last, well, ever since they made the stadium move, that has been a real millstone around the neck of the club. It's something that's meant they've had to keep a certain amount of cash in reserve. It's something that's really inhibited their ability to spend in the transfer market. And, you know, it was an act of, I suppose, generosity, but also proper strategic thinking from the Cronkies. They'd wanted to do this for a long time. They were obviously never going to do it until it was their club. With things changing as rapidly as they were uh, with COVID and the economic landscape, they made that happen. And I think it has freed the club up to a certain extent. So just those things together, I think, have cast maybe a slightly different light on, on the ownership. I think there are still concerns. I think there are still people who have their issues with the Cronkies. I think some of that is always going to be there because Arsenal were a club, let's not forget, I remember being at the, the, the FA Cup final as far back as 2005. Arsenal were beating Manchester United, who'd just been taken over by the Glazers. Arsenal fans were chanting USA, USA, mocking United for that. They were so proud of their English heritage, the marble halls. But I don't think that's really the modern landscape. You know, I don't think there's... a a huge amount of possibility for that to be the case in the Premier League, to be owned by you know someone who's been associated with Arsenal since the day they were born. I think that's quite a slim, realistic possibility these days. And I actually think that the reason that the piece probably sounds slightly more positive is, is simply because we've discovered that the Cronkies are more across things than I perhaps gave them credit. And I, and I say that as someone who reports on Arsenal, who works on Arsenal regularly. You know, the degree to which someone like Stan, look... Maybe he doesn't know who the backup left back is. But what he does know is he knows the numbers. And we're in a period in the club's history, we're in a period in society's history where the numbers are paramount. And what Arsenal do in this 12 to 18 months, the way in which they navigate this very, very difficult economic landscape will be hugely important. And when you look at Stan Kroenke and when you look at his business background, his business pedigree, I think Arsenal could be a lot worse off. Do you reckon part of this, because you're right in a sense that, I mean, I, I don't suppose, fans tend to have entrenched positions with owners. Yeah. Every club's not just Arsenal. <clears throat> so in the same way that you've said, maybe I've, I've, I've kind of underestimated, um, not their intentions, but, you know, their acumen at some yeah. points. What I associate with Arsenal, despite all of this, is clumsy communication. So Gunasaurus, you mentioned before. Yeah. Gunasaurus is... I know it's all very funny and it's tabloid fodder, but I felt like it's a very pertinent example of clubs not being able to get out of their own way sometimes. Mm. Because when that kind of thing happens, I remember reading the initial reports on it and thinking, maybe even texting a couple of guys that I work with, this is how this is going to end. It's going to be a PR disaster or someone's going to take advantage of, of, of it somehow. And lo and behold, I feel like in a way that's kind of symbolic of the Kroenke regime. And it, we've kind of come full circle here as well, because it goes back to that silent stand thing. Absolutely. That kind of, you don't really understand me, but at the same time, I'm not going to ensure that you do understand me better or that I communicate my, my intentions as well as I could do. Yeah. And I think that you're absolutely right. And for Stan, PR is not a focus. His perspective is, well, if I get the numbers right, if the team wins the PR looks after itself. I think that you've touched on something, though, that is important, which is that as supporters, we love to be told stories. Yeah. And, you know, I think... Little nuggets, aren't they? The, little, the, the easy to understand, easy yeah. to... You know, little anecdotes that we can use in conversation. And I think when... It's really telling to me that when Vinay Venkatesham took over as chief executive after Raul Sinead's departure, he was renamed chief executive from managing director... One of the very first things he said is, I want to change and think about the way this club communicates with its supporters and communicates with the world. And I think that's really encouraging because I think, I think you're right. I think that you know, the silent stand thing, it applies not so much 
to him personally, but to the way in which he manages this business and the way in which he communicates a vision for this business. Arsenal feel right now they do have an internal vision. And when they appointed Mikel Arteta, they were thinking about not just saving their season last season, but the next three to five years. And they feel that in Edu, in Mikel Arteta, in Permatecker, in the academy, in Vinay, they feel, and the ownership as well, they feel they have, you know, like a shared idea of where they want to be going. I think it's kind of incumbent on the club to communicate that. And I think that's what really wins you support because ultimately fans, they want to believe in something. So it's a very difficult balance because you never want to sort of set expectations so high that you can't match them. You never want to set up parameters by which you can only fail. But if you can lead people on a path, if you can tell people, look, this is the direction we want to head, then I do think you can win more support. And I think this piece... You know, I, I would never say that it speaks for the Cronkies, but I would say that we've been able to illustrate and illuminate some sense of the direction they want to take the club in the future. You're right. Journey is, that's the magic thing that you need as a fan because like, when I think about my own team, I don't really care where they are on the table and I don't really care whether they lost last weekend or are likely to lose next weekend. What I care about is this idea that me and them together are on some sort of journey towards something. It may be something, you know, other fans look at as being completely insignificant, but I, I want to feel the, the, the kind of tangible progress, if that makes sense. And I feel like that maybe is what's changed at Arsenal because you have all these little things that you can buy into. Mm. Like you can, we don't really know what Mikel Arteta is yet. There are encouraging signs. There are some worrying ones. But at the same time, you know, the idea that this is someone evolving and learning and adapting and, you know, he's got this impeccable CV and he's grown from perfect managerial DNA. Mm. And Edu, Edu, I don't really know anything about Edu as a sporting director. I don't know what his virtues are for the position. And yet I feel positive because there's an investment in him from above. And I feel that, like you mentioned earlier, and we, we, we should touch back on this. Like you talked about, Josh Kroenke being the more PR savvy person. He is a media trained person, mm. whereas his dad had a kind of, well, you know, money figures, you know, that feels like part of this, a manifestation of a different kind of attitude. Mm. Yeah, I think so. And Josh has grown more senior, obviously, within his father's business and, and certainly in relation to Arsenal. And he arrives at Arsenal with decent experience working with some of the Kroenke's US teams too. So I think that is part of it. And you make a really good point about their investment in people. I mean, in Arteta and Edu, I don't think anyone at KSC, I think on the Arsenal board, is under the impression these guys are necessarily the finished article. And I don't think Arteta and Edu have that opinion. They are technical staff, very senior, very much trusted, but also expected to improve, expected to learn. And I think within that, as an Arsenal fan, you can find some optimism because you know, they're investing in very promising people and they're giving them an opportunity to blossom. And listen, it may take time. And patience is a virtue that's hard to find in football these days. But I think, I think one of the themes of this discussion and the themes of this piece is about trying, failing and trying again. You know, you hire Unai Emery to replace Arsene Wenger, it doesn't pan out. You attempt an executive structure to, to succeed Ivan Gazidis, it doesn't pan out. So what do you do? You concentrate on the people, the strengths that you have, the people that you do have faith in. You create efficiency, simplicity. You streamline around those people and you make them the heart of your business, the heart of your club, and you push forward from there. And so as an Arsenal fan, I think there is sign for encouragement there. It's like I think the metaphor is probably of someone you know, hacking their, their way slowly up a mountain. For a long yeah. time, especially during the latter Wenger years, I think it was Arsenal lying on their back, slowly sliding down, mm -hmm. just listlessly. And I, I think that makes a difference to fans. Um, what have we missed from the piece, James? What do we need to talk about? Plug away. It's a really good question. I think, I think one of the things that we've not so much touched on is just, you know, that personal side, what these people are like in company, what they're like in business situations. You know, Stan is someone who... You know, he's not someone who's particularly uh, gregarious. He's quite normal, but he's quite, you know, gently spoken. Does he's... he wear a flamboyant cologne? Do we know that? <laughs> we do know that, that he, he wears quite relaxed things at times. You know, it's not unusual to see him in a non-business setting in a very, uh, you know, relaxed attire. He's someone who's very interested in exercise, who still keeps fit. He's in his 70s, but, you know, he's still, you know, on the treadmill and lifting weights and all those things. Uh, we know about Josh, that he's a very, very easygoing, good to talk to guy, someone who maintains 
personal relationships with athletes because he's a bit younger. I think he's about 40, so he can communicate more with them on a level. We've heard stories about, you know, when Arsenal players get injured, they might receive a, a message from Josh Kroenke that just kind of wishes them well. He's someone who can sort of handle that interpersonal side. There's a more natural connection between him and, and the players. Um, we've learned a bit about the family, about the Kroenke family. I mean, obviously... Anne Kroenke is a Walmart heir. She's known for that, but she's also uh, meant to be a very gregarious person, very engaging company, someone who really relates well to people. And it's interesting that even though, you know, Stan's characterised a certain way, anyone you ask about Anne, their face lights up. You know, she's this super entertaining character. Um, Josh's sister, who is a completely different character, him, is, is, operates more sort of out of the artistic side. I think she runs a foundation that sponsors musicians, and she was known for like bringing uh, kind of you know musicians into the Arsenal boardroom, probably raising a few eyebrows in doing it. But there you go. That feels like something that you know had that happened thirty years ago. <laughs> You, you do hear stories about old kind of mahogany lined boardrooms with some very crusty old I people. I think in it's there. changed a bit these <laughs> days. Um, I'm just trying to think what else really. I mean, obviously we touch on just the sheer amount of change really. And we, we obviously go through, you know, from Arsene Wenger and Ivan Gazidis, these two people that KSE trusted absolutely implicitly because they'd been there such a long time. And, you know, Arsene was both the sporting director and the coach had, I don't want to say autonomy, but really had the run of the club. And they lost them both in the space of a few months. And that's been left to a, a really sort of tumultuous period. And just kind of unpicking that, understanding why some of the changes took place, you know, how we arrived at the situation we're in now, the, the crazy COVID environment they've had to deal with. It's a bit of a roller coaster, to be honest, since 2018. And, and one of the things I would say is that, you know, you mentioned kind of that sense of slight stagnation at Arsenal. I don't know if that's the right word, but the feeling that, the failings were familiar, the faces were familiar. And so much of that, I think, was down to a kind of brinkmanship situation in the boardroom and with the ownership. You know, had Alisher Uzmanov sitting there with 30% of the club completely intransigent and not willing to sell. And that kind of put the brakes on things. As soon as he went, Conkeys had taken hold. And one thing you can't say about Arsenal is that they've been stagnant since. It's been constant motion, constant movement. And that's healthy. I think change, I think churn in any organisation and in any sports organisation tends to be positive. Um, I think we're going to need to take a longer term view. We're going to have to look at this over five years, 10 years to really understand it. But as I said at the top, it's a good time to take stock, to look back and look forward. And that's what we tried to do in the piece. And where can people find the piece? Well, they can find it on The Athletic, either on our app or by visiting theathletic.co.uk. Uh, and handily, there's a special offer at the moment, which you can uh, take advantage of if you go to theathletic.com forward slash TIFO. 